So thank you, Tony, for this impressive and excellent presentation. I want to change the topic a little bit. We go to implant dentistry, and the topic I was asked to present was the augmentation procedures of soft and hard tissues using biomaterials, of course, with focus on bios, uh, on, um, BOTIS biomaterials and their predictability in the daily practice. When we look at the aim of biological bone reconstruction, of course, the thing that we want to see at the end is sufficient bone volume. But this is not everything we want to reach. Another very important aspect that changed the technique from big bone blocks to the shell technique published by Curie and Kuhberg is, is that we want to have a vital bone matrix with high long-term stability. On the other hand, we want to have a safe therapy with predictable outcome, especially for the uh, people that are working in the private practice. They don't want to do experiments with their patients. They want to have a low complication rate. And when we ask a patient when they are very satisfied, it's also accompanied when the patients are having a minimal trauma. We want to talk about bone defect regeneration today, so therefore it makes sense to first look at different bone defect classifications. Of course, we all know the K-word classification. The mainly used classification for localized defects is the cyber classification, differentiating horizontal defects, vertical defects, and combined defects. On the other hand, there are numerous others uh, other authors publishing their own classifications, but what we found in the past was that it's only prescribing the defect itself. It's not taking care of the environment, so therefore we published the C card classification that allows for better estimation of the regenerative capacity of a defect depending on the environment of this area. For example, it makes sense when we just look at a clinical case, when we look at the ideal implant position it's a big difference even if it's both a lateral defect for this posterior and the three anterior implants that in this case, of course, we have a contained defect supported by the mesial and the distal bone wall, whereas in this defect it makes more effort, it is more complicated, probably accompanied with stabilization techniques to have a predictable outcome when we graft this area. What techniques do we have today? Of course, we can do expansion techniques like splitting techniques using uh, piezo surgery. We have autographs, GBR techniques. Nowadays, very common to use allo blocks, especially for larger defects, then sinus lift procedures for the lateral maxilla and destruction osteogenesis. And we want to focus today on a few of these different aspects, like the autographs, for example. Autographs are the golden standard, but they're also limited in terms of volume maintenance. So a defect like this would be a perfect case where we can use autograph material in chip form so we can fill this contained defect with autogenous bone chips. If you want, you can also apply some membrane or even without application of a membrane or even without application of any bone substitute material underneath, this defect configuration based on its environment will lead to a very predictable outcome. If it's not encased in the environment, it becomes more complex, more unpredictable. So in these cases, there's a perforation, a few surgeries in the past, we need for some more stabilization technique for uh, autogenous bone graft. So just putting some corticospongious chips on this side might lead to the effect that we have a resorption on long term. So therefore, we go for the bone blocks. We can harvest it from the ramus region or from the chin region. In this case, we selected a chin block because the chin has a major advantage that we can harvest some sponges bone from the chin region. And the sponges bone is containing a lot of stem cells, a lot of bioactive protein. So that makes this material the most interesting material for augmentation procedures. On the other hand, if we just reconstruct the bone defect with the bone marrow, we can expect a tremendous reduction of the volume. So we have to protect it, like the Kuru technique is describing it. We use a very thin bone block on the lateral aspect to bring more stabilization into the grafted area. And when you focus on the position of the head of the implant screw and at the reentry, we can see that without any membrane, just using thin autologous bone blocks, we can achieve predictable results. 
On the other hand, we also see that is, there's a little point of blood coming out of this graft, so this is standing for a perfect revitalization of the graft, so this is, from our point of view, the most favorable uh, technique for larger and smaller augmentation areas. On the other hand, when we ask our patients, we have the problem that the patients are complaining. Whenever we use autografts, whether it's from the chin or from the ramus region, we have a lot of patients complaining more about the donor side than about the acceptor side. We have moderate risk of nerve injuries, but when we go to the chin region, one of 10 patients is suffering on long term of sensible disturbances of the lower lip or the lower incisors. When we go to the iliac crest, we have a lot of patients suffering from problems with walking, and when we compare the average patient discomfort, which is described for hip grafts of 39 days, compared to bone substitutes of three days, we can see that there is a big advantage of using alternative techniques to the golden standard, the patient's own bone. So when we talk about GBR techniques, and we had a nice presentation this morning about different GBR techniques, then of course we have to, take, uh, to talk about bone substitute materials. And there are a lot of bone substitute materials available in the market. They all can be differentiated in terms of porosity, application form, origin, scientific evidence. And only for the battery calcium phosphates, for example, there are more than 70 three calcium phosphates available in the market. One thing that was focused in the past was that a perfect bone substitute material should be resorbed very quickly, being replaced completely by the patient's own bone tissue. Now we have enough, a lot of studies showing that after 10 years, after 12 years, after 15 years, if a bovine bone substitute material is embedded in the patient's own bone, it shows no resorbability. On the other hand, this is also supporting the volume stability of this graft. So, meaning that when we have a bone substitute material that shows a very slow resorption or just a superficial remodeling, this is on the other side a very good aspect to maintain on the long term the volume stability of the graft. Of course, nothing new to use bone substitute materials in implant dentistry in combination with membranes because we have the problem that the soft tissue is also trying to invade into the defect area, leading to the effect that we have soft tissue encapsulated bone substitute material areas. Is it long-term stable when we do this technique? Lateral augmentation of smaller defects using GBR technique. There's a nice study published by Ronnie Jung and co-workers after 12 to 14 years, and they found no statistically significant difference whether they placed implants in the pristine bone or in bone grafted with uh, uh, bone substitute, bovine bone substitute material covered with a collagen membrane or a non resolvable membrane. Interestingly, even after this time, they found a negative effect of initial descents of the EPDFE membranes, so our favorable technique in our clinic is to use a bovine bone substitute material in combination with the collagen membrane. The problem we see when we use quickly resorbable membranes is that sometimes we have a predictable result, but the result might be very nice but not perfect. Like in this case, it's more important that the implant is primarily stable and not completely encased in the patient's tissue. Lateral augmentation with cerebone, a bovine bone substitute material which has a cintured origin, and then covering with a bioguide membrane. At the re-entry, we can see that there's nice bone formation, but when we focus on this area, we can see that there are some particles just soft tissue encapsulated. So we have a good result, but not a perfect outcome in terms of GBR technique. When we look at the histology, we see areas where the bone substitute material is embedded in newly formed bone matrix. But on the other hand, on the surface, there are some areas that are just soft tissue encapsulated. So, about six years ago, we discussed a lot how to improve collagen membranes to make it longer standing, to have a longer barrier function, even if we keep the positive aspects of the uh, porcelain collagen. And one very obvious aspect was focused on when we look at the bioguide membrane, which is a bilayer membrane consisting of individual collagen strains, and the Jason pericardium membrane, we see 
almost the opposite, that this is a multi-layered network of native collagen one and three fibers, leading to the effect that we can expect more bio, um, the same biodegradation, but longer barrier function when we use these pericardium membranes. Both are showing a nice biocompatibility, but when we look at the histological slides after 24 weeks, after lateral augmentation of cerebone and Jason membrane on lateral defects in dogs, we can see that in the Jason group, there's a thin layer of bone on the outline of the graph. Whereas when we use a single layered bioguide membrane, here this typical soft tissue encapsulated uh, bone substitute material is obvious on the histologies. Both are collagen membranes, so they are resorbed completely within these 24 weeks, so there's no need to remove these membranes in another surgery. Another aspect that might be interesting is to stabilize the graft. So again, when we have a defect on the lateral aspect and there's no bony support from the surrounding areas, then of course we place our bone substitute material and it makes sense to use some pins or some screws to fix the membrane. And this is another aspect of this JSON membrane, that the membrane itself is providing more stability, bringing more stabilization to the graft, meaning that we have probably a more predictable outcome. In some cases, we don't need that long barrier function of four to six months. So we can focus on some other aspects, for example, when we use membranes in combination with autografts or when we use it in combination with allografts because, because allografts are containing collagen and this collagen is supporting the bone formation in the very early phases. Therefore, the cold protect membrane was developed. So it consists of two different aspects. One is a compact layer having the effect that we have a good exclusion of the soft tissue cells, but we see some areas with pores or fine fibular collagen that can be easily resorbed, allowing for blood vessel ingrowth through this matrix that we have a transmembranous angiogenesis that is supporting the bone formation underneath. Interestingly, when we did a histological study implanting these membranes in rats, we could find in these little pores some blood vessels going through this membrane. It was accompanied with the effect that the resorption time of this membrane is just two to three months. So the reduction uh, is significant compared to the JSON membrane, but as I just mentioned, in some indications, there's no need for a very long barrier function. For example, in this case, allograft application with 10 pole technique with some screws on the lateral aspect. In these cases, we would prefer to use uh, angiogenetic membrane on this lateral aspect, soft tissue closure, and because it's an allograft within three months at the reopening, we can see nice bone formation in the entire area. Another aspect might be when we talk about allogenic bone substitute material that we can also use it in block form. When we try to use xenogenic material in block form, it's very fragile, it's hard to uh, fix it with the osteoanthesis screws. So with the allo blocks, we can get very nice results because they are containing this collagen leading to more flexibility of the bone blocks. Uh, case where we used a J-block, a corticosponges J-block, and you can see already that we put some perforations on the cortical plate because at this time we knew already that when we use a good membrane that is allowing for transmembranous angiogenesis, it's more important to have this membrane and early vascularization than this cortical plate on the outline. We entry after six months, we see nice bone formation from the clinical point of view, so we took a biopsy from the crestal part and also another biopsy from the lateral aspect because this is, of course, the golden standard for proving the outcome that we have a histological evaluation. You can see one of these perforations of the J-blocks and in high magnification, we can see that there's beautiful, nice bone formation around the allogenic bone material. There's still some turnover going on, but we see bone formation to the outline of the grafted area. For larger augmentations, we have the problem that it takes time to adapt these bone blocks. Sometimes we get some contamination because we are touching the lip or the tongue of the patient. So in the age of three-dimensional dentistry, of course, there's a new technique just introduced a few years ago based on three-dimensional 
analysis of our patients, what we all do for implant placement, why not just planning the implants in the three-dimensional correct position, planning the three-dimensional size and shape of the graft and transferring this three-dimensional shape to a conventional bone block using a CNC mill and a CAT CAM technique into a patient individualized bone block, which is called the bone builder technique. So when we look at this new technique, of course, we can reduce the operation time for our patients. We can increase the uh, specificity of our blocks adapting to the bottom of the defect. So this video was made by Markus Schley, who is one of the inventors of this technique. We can see that, of course, we need to have some experience with soft tissue handling because this is something that is just to be recommended when we have experience with lateral augmentation with other materials. So careful flap elevation and when we remove all the soft tissue, then the block is rehydrated using a sterile um, uh, syringe containing some sterile saline solution. We just uh, pull out the air bubbles from the block and this block perfectly fits to the recipient area. It's fixed with two osteosynthesis screws and then of course we are focused on one very important aspect that is mainly important for augmentations outside the ridge contour that we have a stabilization of the entire grafted area. So blood vessels can easily invade from the bottom on the defect if we use the angiogenetic membrane, also from the periosteal side. So we see nice results when we use these membranes for smaller and larger augmentation procedures. It's still a bone substitute material, therefore we have to use membranes, of course, following the principle of the GBR technique to maintain the exclusion of the soft tissue cells. Just a few words about another topic, of course, there are thousands of publications about sinus grafting procedures. I just selected one very interesting publication that is a review about other reviews. So uh, Wallace and Tano just included 10 published evidence-based reviews and they combined it with some own experience and they saw, of course, that it's a positive outcome when we put some bone graft material inside the sinus that we have to use rough surface implants. If you uh, include publication from 1980, of course, there are still some machine implants included in the uh, studies. And even in this indication of lateral augmentation, we should consider application of barrier membranes on the facial aspect of the sinus, increasing the predictability of the graft. So for us, it's nice and important that we can, with this model, compare bone substitute materials. For example, we performed a study comparing BIOS versus cerebone, so a non sintered material with a sintered material in 44 external sinus lifts and 34 patients, a prospective randomized clinical multicenter study, and we saw for both materials an excellent volume stability and nice bone formation. We lost a few implants, we had a very low uh, inclusion criteria like remaining bone height of about one millimeters and we just used bone substitute material only. So it's an acceptable success rate. But for us, of course, important newly formed bone matrix, about 30% bone substitute material, about 40 to 43%, so absolutely comparable and also no statistical difference in terms of non mineralized tissue. It's not just us finding these Results, also another group published this year. New bone, 24% for the BIOS group. Cerebone, 29%, but again, not statistically significant. So we can say that both materials are supporting the bone formation inside the sinus with the same quality. What is the difference then? So why should we use Jason and Cerebone instead of uh, uh, BIOS and BioGuide application. For example, in this case, this is reaching the limits. This is a sinus graft. Of course, we can use cerebone particles only, but then for the lateral aspect, we are combining cerebone particles with some autogenous bone of about 25% to increase the biological potency of the graft. And then we are not using double layer techniques that 
uh, making the soft tissue closure even harder that are causing more costs. We are using a single layer JSON membrane application on this side, expecting that we can see what we saw in the animal experiment, that we have a smooth surface at the end of the healing period. So inside the sinus on the lateral aspect, and indeed when we look at the reentry, we can see that in this lateral aspect, and this bone was built about four and a half millimeters in the lateral dimension, we have a smooth surface, so we can scratch on this bone. We have a bone formation to the outline of the graft. And also, because as a study patient, we took a biopsy to look inside the grafted area in the sinus. We see the remaining bone height of about five millimeters. This is inside the sinus. We see bone formation on the surface of the cerebellum particles, some ingrowth, of course, that we are uh, seeing a good osteoconductive property of this material, but same for BIOS particles, that it's not completely resorbed with this, this time. And we expect from both bone substitute materials that if it's embedded in the patient's own newly formed bone, then we see no resorption even on long term. Just a few words about soft tissue augmentation. What can we say about this new technique of using artificial soft tissue grafts that we just saw from Tony Skulian on his last slide. So what is the idea of the mucoderm matrix? We did a lot of research during the development period of the mucoderm. For example, one focus was whether it's better to use a more spongious material or a more compact material. And we found that a more compact material has superior handling properties, but also is showing a nicer volume maintenance than when we just use a very spongious uh, material in an animal study. We implanted it in the oral region as well. So in this case, we uh, look at the three-month results. We can see that in this area, this is the matrix. And for us, of course, it's very important that in this high magnification, we don't see any inflammatory response. Of course, it's an animal study, but this material is perfectly integrated in the surrounding tissue. We see some blood vessels invading into the grafted area. So we can say that this material is accompanied by a known wound healing disturbance, maintaining the soft tissue, uh, um, not comparable to the patient's own tissue, but in some indications probably we can use it for soft tissue augmentation procedures. So that was the end of different prototypes, a native porcelain type 1 and 3 collagen, a compact collagen matrix consisting of a lot of individual collagen strains allowing for good handling properties and undisturbed wound healing. Where can we use it for? We just heard something about recession coverage, so therefore I don't want to focus on this topic, but soft tissue thickening, when we have thin soft tissue, of course that makes it very easy to thicken up the soft tissue because we can overcome the problem of harvesting the tissue from the palate. And then another topic might be the keratinous tissue support or vestibuloplasty that we use it instead of free gingival grafts that are causing a lot of pain, a lot of disturbances to our patients. So one very simple case, application of mucoderm on the lateral aspect, situation after four weeks, so nice and thick soft tissue on the buccal aspect of these implants. When we go to the aesthetic region, there are also some studies going on where this mucoderm is placed on the buccal aspect to enhance the width of the soft tissue on the buccal aspect. We are just running a big study with uh, Arndt Happer in Münster, investigating different biotypes, different treatment approaches. And what we found was that we have some resorption, reduction of the thickness of about 30%, but we can still reach, particularly in thick gingival biotypes, nice and aesthetic results, excluding the problems of harvesting soft tissue from the palate. Last clinical case, this is a patient who avoids to go to the dentist, of course, has a dental fibroma, massive dental fibroma in the upper front. And after a while, he decided, okay, it was visible from outside, so he came to our clinic. And this, in the maxillofacial surgery department, is not a big problem. We just do a resection of this bending tumor. And then at the end of the, the resection, of course, we have a massive defect with resection of also the periosteum. 
So the patient didn't want to undergo a big surgery, so we decided to use Muguderm instead of some other type of grafting, just placed it on the defect area, suturing in the peripheral regions, also on the palate, so it was a large defect, just dressed with this uh, Mucoderm, with the idea that the blood vessels are coming from the bottom of the defect, from the bone, and that collagen would support the healing of this resected area. That was the next appointment when the patient came to our clinic four weeks post-operatively. It looks okay-ish, let's say, so we have a big recession in this area, also a big recession in that area. And then the patient didn't come for a very long period of time, so he just came about one year ago with a two-year post-operative um, situation. We can see he still doesn't go to the dentist, so he has a massive caries in this tooth, but we see a restitutio at integrum meaning that probably the application of this compact collagen matrix had led to the effect that we could support the healing of the soft tissue. And also, this recession, interestingly, was filled up completely without any further operation, leading to the effect that we have a nice positive outcome on long term. So what can we conclude from these different aspects? Of course, we have different aspects that allow for predictable bone defect augmentation. The gold standard still is the autogenous bone, but we also have some indications like lateral defect augmentation using GBR technique and sinus floor elevations that can be predictably solved with bone substitute materials. On the other hand, when we use bone substitute materials, sometimes we are successful even without membranes, but when we have to uh, deliver the best results we can get, we have to use it in combination with membranes because the GBR technique is leading to more predictable results when we compare it to indication where we just use the periosteum only. When we go outside the rich contour, it makes sense to consider placing some pins or splints, some uh, block grafts to increase the st stability of the graft. This is important when we have larger defects, when we have defects that are not supported by the bone environment. Today we see that this native compact collagen matrix is showing promising results in different indications. But of course, if a material is developed about four years ago, we don't have long-term studies that are showing us that we have a perfect alternative to the patient's own tissue from the pellet. So we have to do more studies, and I'm very happy that I saw that there are at least 15 uh, pay, uh, presentations and posters about the Mugodam applications on this European 8 convention to find more about the limits and possibilities of minimal in invasive artificial soft tissue graft augmentation that are focusing on one important aspect, that we are reducing the perioperative stress of all patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention.